Hello folks and welcome back to the geodynamics lectures about heat conduction and heat production. In this, the third of the video lectures on this topic, we're going to talk about heat production, specifically about radiogenic heat production in the Earth. And so that's our main goal for this lecture is to talk about radiogenic heat production in the Earth, how it varies and how it may have implications for geodynamic processes. Radiogenic heat production itself is typically uh, represented with either a capital A or an H. Uh, it depends. And it's something that results from the decay of radioactive elements within the interior of the Earth, specifically uranium-238, uranium-235, thorium-232, and potassium-40. Those are the four main sources of radiogenic heat within the Earth. The letter A is typically used when you're referring to volumetric heat production, so for a certain amount of heat produced per given volume, so that's going to be something that's typically given in microwatts per cubic meter, and H would be uh, the value for heat production by mass, which could be given in watts per kilogram or something like that. You can see down here at the bottom a table of the concentrations of different um, radiogenic elements. So here's uranium in parts per million, thorium in parts per million, and then potassium in percent for different rock types. And so you can see, for instance, uh, higher uranium concentrations in granites and shales, uh, as well as, you know, as potassium, compared to things like uh, basalts or depleted peridotites or much more mafic rocks. So the elements do occur in the mantle, but they're pretty much concentrated in the crust, and that's where radiogenic heating is most significant. The heat flow, as we mentioned in the previous lecture, in continental regions is about 65 milliwatts per square meter, and about half of that, 37 milliwatts per square meter, is from radiogenic heat production. So actually over half uh, is thought to be the result of radioactive decay um, within the crust. Again, this is the um, similar type of table to what we saw in the previous uh, slide, where we're looking at heat production here by mass in watts per kilogram, here by volume in the typical units that are used, which is um, microwatts per cubic meter. And so again, you can see clearly here that we have certain rock types, granite shales, and average continental crust where we have much higher heat production than we have in the other um, materials, in the sort of more mafic materials. And so the typical values are something like two to three microwatts per cubic meter for upper crustal rocks, but the crustal average is actually less than one microwatt per cubic meter. So upper crustal rocks, we have high heat production. As a whole, the crust, though, has heat production that is less than one microwatt per cubic meter on average. What does this suggest to you? And, and can you think of any kind of process that might result in this occurrence? So pause the video for a second. Think about this, the fact that we have what appears to be an increased concentration of heat producing elements in the upper crust and, uh, and see what kind of ideas you can come up with for an explanation. Well, what did you come up with? Um, there is essentially one major process that's sought to control the distribution of these heat producing elements, and that is the fact that the majority of them, uh, uranium and thorium, are fairly large. They are uh, relatively high in terms of their atomic number on the periodic table, and they're basically considered incompatible elements. So they can occasionally find their way into the crystal structure of certain uh, minerals, but essentially when minerals melt, these are the elements that don't want to be incorporated when the rocks cool down and recrystallize. So they're kind of the last things to be incorporated into um, the crystal structure of minerals, and that occurs, of course, for the minerals that have the lowest um, 
crystallization temperatures, and those are the, the silica-rich upper crustal rocks, things that are typical in granites like quartz and feldspars and uh, things like that. Now, if we look at uh, heat production in another way, um, we can consider things like the temporal variation in heat production over the Earth's history, right? Radiogenic heat production occurs as a result of radioactive decay, and as you know, radioactive parent isotopes will decrease in their concentration as a result of decay. And so earlier on in the Earth's history, we would have had higher concentrations of uranium and potassium um, and a slightly higher concentration of thorium, and as a result then, we would have had much higher radiogenic heat production previously, earlier in the Earth's history than we have now. So for example, if we look about 3 billion years ago, um, back in the Archean, we can see heat production values that are more than double um, what we have today. And so that has some important implications because it means that in areas like, um, like here in Northern Europe where we have a shield that has uh, some Archean and Paleoproterozoic components to it, um, that the higher heat production may have actually changed or affected the tectonic activity back in earlier Earth's history. And here's an example of what, um, how this process, I guess, or, or increased um, concentration of heat producing elements may have influenced uh, tectonics. This is a paper out of Nature, I believe from last year. The reference is given at the end of the lecture. And in it, um, we see an example of a continent that is spreading out under its own um, thickness and from being relatively warm. And as it spreads, it actually initiates subduction. So this is an idea that continents spreading out or continents extending um, and gravitationally spreading out may have triggered the earliest um, subduction zones and, and this kind of plate tectonic behavior. So what do we mean? Well, we can go here and look at some uh, kind of additional annotation on here. We have a continent of some thickness initially here, and beside it is some kind of oceanic lithosphere. The continent basically spreads out under its own weight because it's thick and it's warm and it's weak, so it spreads out laterally. And as it spreads laterally, of course, that results in some compression between the continent and the adjacent um, oceanic lithosphere. At some time later on when the continent has spread out more, the oceanic lithosphere then gets forced um, beneath the continent, sort of a forced subduction, because it's relatively buoyant oceanic lithosphere at this time, particularly because the thought is that the oceanic crust would have been thicker and therefore the lithosphere would have been more buoyant. And this subduction is relatively short-lived before the slab detaches, the, the margin stabilizes, and that slab piece then sinks down to the, um, what looks like here would be the boundary between the upper and lower mantle. And so this is an idea of how plate tectonics might have been different back at a time when the heat producing elements were of a greater concentration, so radiogenic heat production would have been much higher. All right, so here's the lecture. It looks like this paper is actually from 2015. And um, if you're looking at this lecture in the Moodle, like you most likely are, now you know it's time to take a quiz. So go ahead and take a quiz, see what you've learned, and come on back for the next one.